hope everybody else is cool with too. Sometimes those these phones do get in our way. But I want to welcome everybody here and, and uh, thank everybody for coming. It's uh, something that is uh, going to be beneficial to travel and so forth in the future. We have these different uh, community workshops and, and it's the one way the city is coming together. This is this one program is something that we as a community, as all the other communities around the, the country are going to be working toward because the federal government, this is one of the uh, portions of their requirements. So, but it's, it's a benefit for, a, for the community. Uh, they also a bit of an expense to the different businesses as they come in. But uh, I really want to thank Ken Johnson and his crew. They, they've been doing an uh, excellent job. Um, all the different communities who have been working together toward this common goal. Turn it over now. And, uh, I'm Anthony Yarbrough and I'm president of the Master Guard Association here in Prattville. I just wanted to welcome everybody here, tell you a little bit, just a tiny bit about Master Guarders. And we, we do a lot of good things, have a lot of fun. Uh, and if you, if you want to learn a little bit about gardening and and, and also help give out information about gardening, then uh, please see one of us. Uh, I think the next uh, Master Gardener classes will probably be, in Atoll County will be probably the next year, around the end of next January. And so uh, it's, it's, it's had a lot of fun. I want to tell you about a little workshop that's coming up. Uh, how many of you like tomatoes? Ooh. How many like growing tomatoes? <laughs> There's a tomato workshop in Tuskegee on uh, May the 5th and um, April, April. Excuse me. <laughs> April. April 5th, next week. And you need to call and reserve 334-727-0340 is the phone number. And uh, I'll be coming from Prattville if somebody wants to ride. Uh, but I'm planning on going. So uh, it, it, last year they had it in Montgomery and I couldn't make it. It was a fantastic workshop from what I hear. So again, welcome everybody and uh, and enjoy the day. Okay, we're just going to jump right into this because we're getting just a few minutes late start and um, I actually ended up having more information than I thought I would. So we'll see if I can get this done in the appropriate amount of time. First, let, you, let me introduce myself. My name is Ashley Henderson, and I'm with the Alabama Clean Water Partnership. And just like our name says, we like to do things with partners. Uh, we like to work together on projects that will benefit our communities, but also will benefit our lakes, rivers, and streams. And I'll talk to you more about that in just a minute. Um, first, um, I want to make sure everybody has handouts. You don't have handouts, Mallory, you can get them for you. And then um, we'll just jump right into this. I'll talk a little bit about our partners for this particular project. Um, so you can see up here and you can follow along in your handout uh, that we have several great partners. Um, of course, Anthony came up. He's with Master Gardeners. They were a big help to us getting this, everything set up and ready to go. Um, and we had North Carolina State um, a Cooperative Extension help with the um, presentation. And Alabama Cooperative Extension, that's Mallory Kelly. She helped us uh, with getting plants and getting this set up. And then also, uh, the city of Prattville was a big, big player in this. Um, Ken is um, excellent with the, the plants throughout uh, Prattville, and we kind of tapped him and said, let's go do something a little bit different, and he jumped right in. And Ken, I think if you would say a few words about who I helped you and... First of all, I'll say good morning. Uh, I'd love to have a sunny day, but we'll take what we've got. Uh, Mayor, thank you very much for, for coming and, and visiting with us this morning. I'll only take a couple of minutes, um, and, and what a great turnout. Uh, it, it makes us very happy when we see people that are genuinely interested in, in what we love to do as the horticultural department for the city of Prattville. This is just another example uh, of what can happen when you get several groups that are working together. And this morning I wanted to particularly 
acknowledge the, the care and the help of, uh, of several departments within the city. One being the street department, and, and I was hoping that George Williams would be here, but without his assistance, this project would not have happened. Joel Duke, the city planner, was an intricate player. Uh, Robbie Anderson with the engineering department certainly helped Ashley in the design and, and led us to knowing pretty much exactly what we needed to do. So my hat is off to those people. It's, it's a pleasure when you can have that type of cooperation within the city. And lastly, I, I want to recognize my staff, and if they'll stand, uh, this small group of people are the ones that are responsible for the beautification of the project. Very proud of them, and uh, and and hopefully that story will continue. So uh, enjoy the morning. Uh, we'll adjourn here, and then we'll we'll proceed down to the site, and we'll uh, we'll offer a little bit more detailed information on how we went about building this rain garden. So thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to jump right in. And um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the Clean Water Partnership because I hope you'll start to begin to get familiar with our name. Um, and when you see something that we've done that you're interested in, you'll come out and participate with us. But we're a nonprofit organization, and uh, the thing that we're really interested in is water quality. And we're also interested in, as our name says, working together. We like to provide a neutral forum, so we don't advocate for one side against another, and you'll never see the Clean Water Partnership involved in some sort of lawsuit. That's not something we do. We want to work together and uh, make projects that are win-win for communities. This is kind of how we do that. These are our three main methods. We provide a quarterly forum. We have Every three months we have a meeting, we invite anybody that's interested in water quality issues, whether they're an individual, a business, a municipality, a state government agency, a federal government agency, to come together for a meeting, about three hour meeting. We always have something educational, something that's going on in the area, but then we give people time to network so that they can learn what the other person is doing. And the reason we do that is because we want to maximize resources and be as, a, as efficient with our resources as we can. We want to do more with less. I think that's going to be really, uh, has been for the last several years and will continue to be kind of the buzzword uh, in getting things done. We also like to educate kids and adults. So we have, uh, we go into schools, we uh, work with water festivals, we have workshops like this. Uh, just a plethora of things, and then finally we implement on the ground project, which is what Ken's been working so hard, and that's putting in this bioretention area, also sometimes known as a rain garden, uh, here in Crackle that I'll tell you more about later, but basically what we're doing is we're treating stormwater when it rains before it reaches the creek using plants and to help improve water quality. So this is a little bit about the Clean Water Partnership of where we are. Um, you can see that this blue area here is the Alabama River. The orange, the dark orange area or red is the Tallapoosa River and the lighter orange is the Coosa River. So that's where we get our river region. Those three rivers, Alabama, Coosa come together and form, I mean the Tallapoosa and the Coosa come together to form the Alabama River near Fort Toulouse. And, um, so everything in this area is called the Alabama River Watershed, Tallapoosa River Watershed, Coosa River Watershed. And that may be introducing a new term to you. What is a watershed? And basically, a watershed is any area of land that drains to a particular point. So this map has a good illustration. If we're looking for what drains to this point, we can follow this dashed line and we will see that any rainfall that falls on that land will end up draining to that point. So that is a watershed. So if we'll back up one, you can just imagine that these areas outline the watershed. So if you look at this blue area 
and you were to live inside that area, you would live in the Alabama River watershed. However, if you lived in the Coosa River watershed or the Tallahassee River watershed, that's also part of the Alabama watershed because eventually whatever's in the Coosa and Tallahassee ends up in the Alabama. And we are also part of the Mobile Bay watershed because anything in the Alabama River, at this point, the Alabama and the Tom Bigby come together to form the Mobile River. So we would be part of the Mobile River watershed. And then if you start looking larger and larger, you can see how we're uh, the Gulf of Mexico watershed, which drains a large portion of the United States. So everything that we do in our landscape impacts the Gulf of Mexico and everything between here and there. And then I always like to kind of remind people of that fourth grade class that they had to go to. And uh, I'm, I may be luckier than you because I had a fourth grader last year and I got schooled on this <laughs> again. Um, so anyway, but just real quick, uh, this is just our water cycle. Condensation, we all know that water vapor collects in the clouds. And when it gets heavy enough, we have some sort of pre precipitation, rain, sleet, snow. It ends up on our watershed. When we get to our watershed, then it runs off as some sort of surface runoff, or it percolates into the ground and goes down to our shallow or deep groundwater um, tables. So if it runs off in our surface water, it ends up in our lakes, our rivers, our streams, where it has a chance to evaporate or it ends up on our landscape where it has a chance to transpirate, which is just the plants taking up the water, using them, and releasing water vapor. So let's put that together and we have a really nice word, evapotranspiration, um, and our water, our water vapors then collect in the clouds and we start the whole cycle all over again. And the reason that I tell you that is to get to this slide right here. This is what really, when we really start impacting the water cycle. Now we all know that water is a natural resource and, and we will never have any more water, any less water than what we have right now. Uh, however, we can impact what happens to that water and where that water ends up. So we'll look first at natural ground cover. So if you have natural ground cover, grasses, trees, shrubs, those kind of things, you will see what happens when it rains. You'll have about 40% evapotranspiration. You'll have 25% that is shallow infiltration. That means that it is shallow enough for the plants to use. You'll have about 25% of deep infiltration. This is water that makes it down to our aquifers and oftentimes supplies communities or even farmers or sometimes even homeowners will, with well water. And then we have 10% runoff. So really very little of that rain ends up making it down to our stream, our river, or creek because it's intercepted by something. It's intercepted by <coughs> our plants, by shrubs, by trees, all of those things. But as we start changing things, we see that that whole percentage, that balance, starts changing so that by the time we get this 75 to 100 percent impervious, which would be a really large city, we will now have 30 percent that evapotranspirates. We'll have 10 percent that is shallow infiltration. So we start seeing the effects of that because we have to water more often. We have 5% deep infiltration. We see the impacts of that because our aquifers um, start, the, the water table in those start lowering, and we might not be able to pump from an aquifer that we've used before. We might have to lower our pumps in, that, in the wells that we're using. And then finally, we see this big number right here, 55% runoff. So now we've gone from 10% runoff to 55% runoff. And what I want to talk about today is how a rain garden or some of these other um, practices can help us mitigate, use this type of more developed area to mimic that type of more natural area. So it's not that we don't need to develop, it's just that we need to, when we develop, we need to think, how can we mimic this because it's actually less expensive to mimic this 
and try to deal with this because this causes not just water quality problems, but it also is what you start seeing flooding. You've probably all seen areas that when you were younger, they never flooded, and now they flood regularly. This is one of the reasons for that. So, here's our problem, which sounds crazy. We have too much water and not enough water. So we have too much water running off and not enough water infiltrating into the ground. <coughs> and I'm an engineer, so I like to show graphs and do nerdy things. So y'all better read this. <laughs> okay, so this, this graph will show you, like, if we had natural ground cover, trees, grass, shrubs, and now I made it rain. <laughs> and then what happens next is we have a hydrograph, okay? A hydrograph is just, if you look at a particular point in the river over time, what happens with the flow in it? Do you have more, do you have less? So when it starts to rain, you look at that flow and it's, it's pretty low because the rain hasn't gotten there yet. You know, it's being intercepted. It's, in, it's like in puddles. It's on the tree leaves. But over time, it finally starts making it to the river. And you can see this is flow rate. And it gradually increases. And then it gradually decreases after the storm is over until it's back at its base flow rate. We develop things because we like to have convenient places for, for ourselves to shop and do things. And then what happens? We have a unit hydrograph, and we end up having more runoff. And it also arrives faster because we have man-made structures that do nothing to really slow the water down. In fact, they're designed to speed the water up. Um, when I was in college, that's what we designed. We wanted to get the water out of a place. We really weren't taught to think about, okay, well, if you get it out of this place, it's going to end up at some other place and what's happening there. And then the next thing that, that we're really interested in as a Clean Water Partnership is this thing that's called non-point source pollution, which is a little bit hard to kind of think, what does that mean, non-point source? Well, a point source is any kind of pollution that ends up your, in your river that comes from a pipe, like say from a factory. They use water, they treat water, they discharge water. Well, we're, we're, we really don't look at that because that's a regulatory issue. That's something that our Department of Environmental Management and the Environmental Protection Agency looks at, and they have permits for those um, industries. What we're interested in is what's called non-point source <coughs> pollution. Well, that pollution is pollution that comes from everyday uses of our landscape, of our watershed. It comes from anything that is put on the landscape that when it rains, it goes along and picks up those pollutants and they end up in the river or stream or lake. So here's a few examples of those. Bacteria from pests or wildlife waste. Gasoline and motor oil from cars that leak or if we're not careful when we fuel our car. Fertilized pesticides and herbicides. Um, now, all of, I'm not saying we shouldn't use those things. What I'm saying is we need to follow the instructions. One, because it will save us money if we don't put too much on our plants. But two, um, it will help prevent those things from entering our rivers and streams and lakes. Give you the example of fertilizer. A lot of people, if they put fertilizer on their yard, yard they say, okay, it's going to rain tomorrow. I'm going to put fertilizer on my yard, and the rain's going to water it in. Everybody says that, but then the next day comes and it doesn't rain gently and melt the water, um, I mean, melt the fertilizer and let it go into your yard. It rains, it's a gully washer. So um, the water comes and instead of melting the fertilizer, it picks it up and it takes it with it and it takes it down to your local stream and it fertilizes the stream, which means that it fertilizes the algae in the stream or any other thing like that. And as it fertilizes algae, algae uses up the oxygen in the stream. So now you have algae, and you've used up the oxygen in the stream, and you have low oxygen, low dissolved oxygen in the stream. This is common like where people think of like a fish kill at a pond, at a farm pond or something like that. That's what's happening when you see a fish kill at those things. That algae, usually in that case, is heated up by the sun in a lot of cases, 
it grows then as well. Um, and then another thing is soil. Uh, you think, what's wrong with soil? What's wrong with dirt? The, the creek bed is already dirt. Well, um, as you have more and more soil come in, it just kind of chokes out everything that's in there because um, all of your aquatic habitat in there likes a stable system. It doesn't like for you to increase the soil um, like that. And finally, what you end up with, that the mayor was alluding to earlier, is you end up with an impaired stream. This is in Montgomery County. Kadoma Creek is impaired. The reason that it is impaired is because of this low dissolved oxygen, it's also called organic enrichment um, of the creek, and for pathogens. So once you get an impaired stream, there's lots of things you can and cannot do, and there's lots of things that people that are responsible for this must do um, to help protect this watershed, including, now this is not something that has happened here, but you can get to the point where the EPA will say, you cannot have a, another industry because that industry will have to discharge to the Alabama River or to this river or that river, and that river is impaired. Now, they, I, I want to make sure you know, the Alabama River is not impaired at this point. But the EPA could say, you can't have an industry there because that's an impaired river. That's what they're going to have to discharge to. So you see, if we all work a little bit, this works in many different ways to help our communities. Okay, so we're going to jump right in now to rain gardens. How can a rain garden help us? Basically, it acts as a natural <coughs> feature to intercept um, our rainfall, and it allows it to drain into the rain garden. It allows the plants to uptake some of those pollutants. It allows it to seep back through the ground to our water tables. Uh, and then if it overflows, the overflow ends up in our creek uh, that is already treated. Or actually, you have the under drain. Uh, it's very interesting because your first inch of rainfall, you can remove, if you can treat that first inch, you can remove about 80 to 90% of the pollutants. So you don't have to treat all the rain because, of course, that first inch is what is basically cleaning your landscape. problems here with the side. I guess I did this because this is my mom right here. We're going to make sure you got a little rain garden that they did in Troy at the Pike Pioneer Museum. I'll tell you real quick, how do you build your rain garden? And we're going to go over these separately. First, you need to check out your soil and see if your soil will work for a rain garden. Second, you need to choose your location in your yard. Where's your rain garden going to go? Then you have to de determine the size that you want. Then you have to select your plants. And finally, this one says, work hard. <laughs> of course, if you guys are gardeners, you know that that's part of it, right? I didn't surprise you with that, did I? Okay, so first, look at your soil. And when you look at your soil, are sandy soils. But you can even install rain gardens in some clays. Um, but they cannot be installed in what is like an impermeable or a wetland soil, okay? And I'm going to tell you how to recognize this. So what you want to do is you want to examine your soil at your site. You want to go out with a shovel, he has a little auger, and pull up the soil and look at it. So this is your signs of impermeable soil. I really didn't put any pictures of good soil because I wanted you to be able to recognize this because this is the one area where your rain garden will not work. If you always have ponding water, um, if you have a wetland soil, it will be gray with areas of brown or sometimes of orange, orange stripes in it. And waterfall will remain in that area for two days after it has rained. So if you have a rain and two days later it's still, water is still in that area, and I don't mean just wet, I mean water then you probably have a wetland soil and a rain garden will not work. Um, a, a backyard wetland will work, and we're not going to talk about those today, but if you find this is an issue, give me a call and I'll talk to you about those independently. So here's a couple other pictures. You can see here that it's got those orange model colors or the gray. You can see some of this is orange and gray. So that's what your wetland soils are going to 
are going to look like. There's more pictures. This is a. This is really kind of the. Okay, we'll just test this thing because I'm not sure. So what we're going to do at this point is we'll dig a one foot deep hole. You know, this is just post holes that they dug it with. Dig, dig one foot deep and fill it up with water. Uh, try to get time when it's not going to rain so you can see what's going to happen. Fill it up with water and then go back after a couple of days. If it has no rainfall, the water's gone. That's a great site for a rain garden. If the water's still in the hole, backyard well. Okay? So, then you want to choose a location of your garden. So you need to observe what happens when it rains in my yard. Where does the water end up? Where does it come from? Where does it flow to? So that's what these people, it took about six of them to observe when the rain was <laughs> You could probably do it on your own. So sometimes you'll have something like this. You know, your water will drain down a, a walkway or a driveway or you'll have a swale in your yard, something like that. You'll, you might have a pinch point. That's more like the swale where it's, it's just a low point. You may have grass there and the water comes into that area. You also may notice this um, where you have some bare ground because the high water velocity has taken all of the, the grass and kind of has eroded that area. So you can tell that water is flowing in that area. And what you want to do is you want to place your garden between where it's coming from and, and where it's ending up. So you want to intercept it. Um, so if it's flowing, you, of course, that basically means if it's raining on your house and it goes through your yard and ends up in the street or ends up in the ditch behind your house, you want to catch it between your house and the ditch, okay? And you want to find that, that low spot is probably the best spot. You don't want it to leave the property. You don't want it to end up in a ditch or end up in a stream or anything like that. You want to catch it before it, it does any of those things. And these are a couple other things that you want to consider, you want to think about. You don't want it close to your house you, because you're going to try to hold some water in that. And of course you don't want to do that right up against your house. You want it to be at least 10 feet away from your house. Or if you have a well in your yard, you want it to be at least 10 feet away from that. Then if you have a septic line in your, in your yard, you want it to be 25 feet away from your septic system drain lines. Okay? One thing you certainly don't want to do is go out there and dig up one of your drain lines or something like that. So make sure you avoid your septic system. Away from utility lines, so if you have cable or something like that in your yard, you want to avoid those things, and you want to try to make it in full to partial sun. One of the reasons that you want it to have sun is because that helps with any kind of bacteria issues. It helps dry everything out. So, here's, here's a, a secondary consideration. Um, you, you might have a place that is, you know, it's a natural interceptor point. But then you might decide, okay, well, I can direct some of my flow the way I want it to go if you have downspout. So what they're doing here is they just decided to increase instead of just have the downspout come to a splash pad right there, they've decided to add this hose and direct it to their rain garden, okay? And then the last thing is about garden timing. You want to make sure that your garden is done after other construction is finished. So if you live in a neighborhood that there's a chance uh, that some construction around you might put some sort of soil or dirt on your property, you want to wait because you don't want to clog up your rain garden. Or if you're doing other landscaping projects that if it rained it might pull that dirt into your rain garden, you want to wait until you're, you're finished with those things. And of course, planting is done best between November and April. Okay, so next, you need to know kind of how big do I need my rain garden. 
Now, um, this is kind of subjective, and we're going to go over how you <coughs> determine it, but I don't want you to think, well, I'm supposed to have a 10 by 10 foot area, and I can only manage an 8 by 8 foot or something like that, so I'm just not going to do it because I can't get the 10 by 10. Remember what I said earlier, that if you could treat that 1%, that first inch, you'd get 80 to 90%? Well, if you have to undersize your rain garden, all you're doing is instead of treating an inch, you might be treating three quarters of an inch. So you're still making a benefit for water quality and you're still doing a good job with your rain garden. So um, I certainly don't want you to say, no, I can't do it because I don't have enough space. Use the space that you have, but this will give you an idea of how big it should be. So how much runoff is coming from your impervious area? So look, is, is the water going to come from the back side of my house and only really from the roof, you want impervious areas. If it's grass or has shrubs, you don't have to worry about that area. What you're worrying about is, is it coming from my sidewalk? Is it coming from my driveway? Is it coming from my rooftop? Where is the water coming from? So determine where your impervious areas are, and then you can start sizing it. There you go, roof, driveway, and then you finally decide, okay, well, how deep do I want this after a rain? Do I want it to be six inches deep, three inches deep, somewhere in between? That's a personal preference. So you can imagine if you're going to, you, you want to collect the same volume of water, and if it's only going to be three inches deep, then you're going to need a bigger area. If you'll let it be six inches deep, you can get away with a smaller area. Okay? And then, here is the chart. It tells you what to do. Divide your area by 20 for 6 inches deep and divide your area by 10. That's just a really quick uh, rule of thumb. It won't give you exact answers, but it gives you good enough for you to work with. Or you can use this chart. Okay, and you should have that chart in your uh, handout. And I'm sorry, it's so small. Uh, if you need another chart, let me know. So if you figure out that you have 800 square feet with a six foot deep um, pool, you need about 40 square feet. And this just gives you some ideas. That 40 square feet could be four, in, four feet by 10 feet, five by eight, six by seven. And most people don't want these things square. They'd like to have some nice shape. So just kind of aim for that general size. Okay, here's an example that I wanted to go through. So your house is 60 by 60 feet. <coughs> and you say, okay, that's how big my house is. But only about 25% is going to my backyard and it's going to end up in the rain garden. Okay, so all of this can be estimates. You don't have to be exact with this. So you know that. And then you know your driveway area. Say my driveway is about 500 square feet. Okay, just length time width of your driveway, and I know all of that is going to where I want my rain garden. And I've decided that it's okay with me if I have six inches in ponding depth. Okay, so what you do is you calculate your roof area. We said it was 60 by 60, so that's 3,600 square feet. But you, you've estimated that only about 25% of that is going to end up in your, your rain garden. So you reduce it, you just multiply it by the 25%, that's 900, divided by 4, whatever, 900. And then you add those together, that gives you your total impermeable area. So you have 1,400 square feet. And since we said it was okay for us to have 6-inch ponding, we were good with that. We didn't mind if it has. Some people don't want that much ponding. Um, but if, if you're good with that, you divide by 20, and you know, okay, well, my rain garden needs to be about 70 square feet, which it needs to be either about 5 by 14 or 7 by 10. That would be the ideal size. Okay. However, like I said, mentioned before, if you don't have that kind of room, that's not a problem. I would suggest that you do what you can, and then maybe as you see how it's working and how it's operating, you can always expand the size of it a little bit like you would any other garden. And see, this is just, you know, this is kind of a kidney shape, but they kind of measured it based on their um, information to get close to the size that they needed. 
So this is what I, I guess I keep saying, is the size is flexible. You could even go deeper if you wanted to. If you, if you go out there and your uh, soil drains real fast, you, you fill it up with water and it drains really fast, you can decrease the size. You'll know then, oh, well, I might can make this smaller. Or if it takes it not two days, but say a day and a half to drain, you think, okay, well, my soil won't drain as much, so I may have to make this larger. And then, that's, as I keep saying, work with the area you have. Um, if you don't have the area that your calculations say you should have, that's okay, just go with it. These are some examples of some different type of um, areas. So this area, they, they've done a nice job. They put some flowers around the outside to dress it up and make it look nice. And then the rain garden is back here. You can see how it's sloped down to the rain garden. And here's one at home. Here's your rain garden right here in front. So it's just taking pretty much the, anything that's running off that house. Um, I don't think, it doesn't look like it's really intercepting anything from the driveway, but it's right there next to the street. And then this is a larger installation. Um, you can see how they're really capturing the water right before it goes into this water body. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the hard work part of it, okay? <laughs> So you, you're looking at where it goes, you, you, you kind of outline that, you know where your pinch point is, and, and you figure it out. That's where I'm going to put my rain garden. I've got enough space there, close, and I'm going to put my rain garden right there. So before you start digging, of course, you want to kind of lay it out so you know if you have enough space. So there's several ways to do that. In this picture, you can faintly see that they just took uh, a spray paint and they outlined the area with spray paint. You can also use a string or a hose or anything like that that you would do to outline any kind of garden that you have. And then you start digging. So you decide, you've decided what you're trying to do basically is dig a bowl to hold this water. So you kind of know if you want six inches, four inches, so you start digging, and you can just estimate all this, how deep you've dug. You take your grass up, of course, but save it. And then you dig out your area. And the best way to have it is with a, even as you dig it, then have a little bit deeper area in the very center of it. So really, want, you want it to be like a bowl. <coughs> and then if you have a sloped side, so that, say the water here is coming down this hill, what they've decided to do is to put a berm around here. So they're basically creating a little dam so that as it comes down the hill, it'll hit that berm and it'll kind of dam up behind it. And you can see how they've decided to make sort of a semicircle so that it, it captures the water. And then this is where you want to save the grass is because you can put your grass on that berm so it's a, a grassy area. And then you want to cover the berm, like I said, with the grass, and put uh, <clears throat> cover anything that is um, that you dug up that's bare ground. You want to cover it with some sort of mulch or straw so that when it rains, it doesn't wash that away into our rivers and streams. Here's our berm. And then, of course, you want to plant your plants. And Mallory is going to give us more details about what kind of plants we want to use. And you also want to mulch the plants because that mulch helps these plants like any other in keeping them cool and allowing them to retain some moisture so if they have to go long periods between rains. <coughs> and here's a little bit about the mulch and now we may talk about this too. You're going to want to use a hardwood mulch instead of pine straw or something like that because it will float. And that's what you're trying to avoid, is you don't want your mulch floating away. You want something that's a little bit denser so that it'll stay in place. Because you know this particular garden is right in the path of water. Okay? So it, it's going to want to float if you don't look specifically for that. Here's mm -hmm. the pine straw. The pine straw will end up somewhere else. So these are a few good things. Remove pollutants, maintain soil moisture, and prevents erosion. 
So that's all great reasons to add mulch. And here is that little rain garden that they were working on. It's just really small, has a few plants in it. Okay. Finally, we're going to get to oh, our rain garden down here. <laughs> now, um, we, as I talked about before, we work together as partners, and we were able to do a lot with a little. So the Clean Water Partnership had a, a grant, and we talked to the city of Prattville, and they were willing to come on board with us, as well as Extension and then Master Gardeners, and all of a sudden, we have a, a project. And the main thing I want to tell you about, that this is a big project. You wouldn't want to have this in your backyard. <laughs> I don't want it to scare you and think, oh my goodness, I can't do that, because look at what they've had to do. This is a big project. This, this is um, draining an acre of land. So it's not draining your house, it's draining street and sidewalk and all that kind of stuff. And the other thing that we've done in this particular area that kind of makes it a little bit different from a rain garden, you kind of hear the words bioretention area and rain garden used interchangeably. Um, I have been told that a rain garden is what I've just described to you guys, and that a bioretention area has soil replaced, which we did so that our soil will allow even better infiltration. And we also put an under drain in this rain garden bioretention area because we need to make sure that our water will go through that area and will drain out. Now, in your rain garden, for example, what if you do get a gully washer? What's going to happen with your water? You're going to fill up your rain garden and then your water is going to continue to go in the path that it's always gone. Like if you have that area where they had to create the berm, the berm would be just like a dam at a pond. You will fill up your rain garden and inch number two of rain is just going to overflow and go into the area that it always has gone. In our case, if we overflow, well, first of all, we have under drain, so we can take a little bit more rain. But if we overflow, same thing. We're going to go over one edge and then down to the creek. Because what we're really trying to do is capture that first inch of water. Okay, so this is what was done. We went in, we <coughs> dug up our area for our bioretention area. And I told you we put under drains in there. So we had slotted pipes. We put slotted pipes in there, we put a rock level over it, we put um, a, bio, a, a filter fabric over it to kind of try to keep things from getting clogged up. And then this area was um, trenched for that pipe to end up in our creek so that after the water goes through, it drains in the pipe and then out into the creek. Um, let, me, let me back up, because I really said that wrong. A lot of the water is going to infiltrate into this area um, because we've increased our soil, and our sandiness of our soil, and we're going to infiltrate a lot of that water. But some of it will make it to the pipe, and that next to the pipe will be treated by going through the soil. The plants will uptake all of the, the um, extra fertilizers, phosphorus, uh, nitrogen will be used by the plants, and then the water will end up in our creek. So here's where we're putting that gravel in, and then, not we, these guys in the back of the <laughs> And this is where we added the soil to it, and what we're going to see today is after this, because they've got plants in now, and you'll be able to see exactly what it looks like. And tomorrow you'll be able to see it working, because it's supposed to rain on it. <laughs> Okay, one last thing that I have, real quick. I recognize several of you guys in here because you've been to one of my rain barrel workshops. Um, however, if you're interested in rain barrels and you think about it a minute, it works kind of like a rain garden in that you're, you're capturing water, you're preventing it from flowing into our rivers and streams very quickly. And if you're interested in a rain, a rain barrel, say you might have a rain barrel and that will help you um, feed your, your water, your rain garden. When it's dry. We have some workshops and a website if you're interested in those. I've talked to Anthony. We're going to try to get one here in Prattville as well, but if you can't wait, you can come to Montgomery and do one. We had several here in Prattville, but not one this year. Um, those are our dates and our website. And then here's my information. 
And I wanted to put this up here for a couple reasons. One, if you're interested in something else, like a rain barrel workshop. But if you're interested in, this is something new to Alabama. Um, this is being used all throughout um, the country because of those concerns about keeping water quality um, as, as good as we can have it. We've kind of taken that for granted in some ways in Alabama because we have such an abundance of water. But as we put more and more uses on that water, we, we've got to get a little bit smarter about how we do things. So we're learning. You know, we're gonna this is we're gonna see how it works tomorrow, and then hopefully we'll learn as we go. But I want to put my name up there. If you're interested in doing this in your yard, and you just want me to come and look at it with you and kind of talk it through with you, I'll be happy to do that. Okay, my schedule is kind of crazy, so it may take you a few days to get in touch with me and for us to get together. But feel free to give me a call because if I can come help you, then I learn. Uh, my information is on that packet as well, so it's on the very back page. And now we're gonna, Mallory's gonna come and talk to you more about plants. I kind of left that out all together because Mallory is our plant. Ashley, uh, besides the city of Prattville, is my neighborhood wanting to do a rain barrel workshop? You could do that too? Yes, you certainly could. Um, I like to have, I like to have 20 to 25 in there. But if we could get 15 in there, it, I think it'll definitely be worth our while to go ahead and do a workshop. So if you're interested in helping put together a workshop, let me know. recognize real quick Yvonne Thomas in the back. She's the county extension coordinator for Otago County and um, she helped get the word out. Maybe some of y'all found out about this through the county newsletter, uh, newspaper, the uh, a flyer at the library, something like that. So um, I just want to thank her for that. Um, but I am the county extension horticulturist but I cover five counties here in central Alabama. So if y'all um, are here because you're interested in gardening, rain gardening, I know a lot of you have master gardeners, um, we do have a lot of things going on, not just in Otago County, but in the surrounding counties, everything from vegetable gardening, um, turf workshops, uh, um, grafting workshops, information on daylilies, fire ants, pruning workshops, you name it, um, we have it all going on. So um, contact your county extension office for information on where and when all those are going on. But in the next few months, we are going to have lots of those opportunities. So if you are interested. Um, and then also, like you said, the tomato workshop, that's next Tuesday in Tuskegee. So it's a little bit of a hike from here, but if you're interested. And then also, um, lots of you here are Master Gardeners, but if you're not, um, we have the Master Gardener Helpline going on right now, and that is um, Master Gardeners helping me um, filter out the calls that come from all the counties in this region. Um, want to know, you know, is it time to prune my grape myrtle, or how should I um, prune my rose, or why is my squash not producing squash? That's a number you can call. And it's one eight seven seven ALA grow A L A G R O W. So, just wanted to put a little plug in there for all that we've got going on. Um, but if you're not familiar with your local extension office, I would definitely recommend it. It's a great resource with tons of information <coughs> at your fingertips. So, but um, so I'm going to talk just briefly about some plant selections that you can choose to put in this rain garden that we've now built. And um, if you see, you have my PowerPoint that just has maybe 16, 17 plants in it. And then this plant list, the ones that are in yellow are the ones that are in your, uh, that are highlighted in this uh, PowerPoint. So, um, we're just going to go through and talk about a few of them that I've pulled out to highlight. And many of these are going to be out on this site when we go out. Um, this is a list of plants that were compiled by a professor at Auburn um, that they had a grant money to get the plants with that he's been a great resource for us to get the plants from him to plant out there. So um, we'll just briefly go through them 
And um, here's a, a tree that would be a good selection. You don't see this planted very often around here, but it is an excellent choice of a tree. Um, you would often hear it called the Grancy Graybeard um, or the Fringe Tree. Um, do any of y'all, are y'all familiar with this tree? Or seen it? A few of you? Um, it is a beautiful tree and it flowers when the dogwoods and azaleas are blooming. So it would be something really now that you would see. And is that also a bush too? It, it's a it smaller a tree, kind of an understory. Um, it might start out looking like a bush, but eventually it should turn That's into a tree form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They cut it before kind of tree. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, and I have this all, all in your packet, but the zones, but all of these can be drawn in this zone that I'm going to go over today. It is native, deciduous, drops its leaves in the winter. Um, it's a butterfly and a bird attractant. And um, it does have a fragrance to it. So, and as you see, it'll get about 20 feet tall, but it's a good understory um, tree like the dogwood, but it can also take full sun. So, um, this is the Magnolia Virginiana Sweet Bay Magnolia. Um, it does have the red berries and it has the flower like the magnolia as well. But a good characteristic about this tree is that the back side of the leaves are kind of a silvery um, color. So, in the wind, it's really pretty and it adds a little texture to the um, landscape as well. It is native, it does have some fragrance to it with the flowers. Um, it is evergreen, so it doesn't drop its leaves. Uh, and then, um, but the berries are non-edible, so that would be, we're going to talk about some that are edible, but. Um, this here is Alex vomitoria, um, and there's different varieties of this. Uh, it can be anything from a, you know, manageable shrub to getting into a large tree as it gets older. Um, it gets about 20 feet tall on average, but it can get bigger than that. <laughs> um, it can take dense shade all the way to full sun, so a large range if you're looking for plants that are good selections for your rain garden. Um, it has the flowers that it would be having right now for the honeybees, and um, also has the fruit. But to have fruit, you need a male and a female of the um, Ilex vomitoria variety so that you would have the berries. Uh, it's native, evergreen, and it's an excellent bird and butterfly attractant. And it can also tolerate drought. And in here, I'll have some, there's a few little notes. Some of them can take really wet feet, some of them can take drought, and some can take both. So depending on where you're going to be putting um, the plants, those would be things you want to take into consideration. Um, so just some large shrub selections. <coughs> Um, that are from that list. This is the Aronia arbutifolia, um, and it's called the red chokeberry. It is edible, but it has a real astringent um, flavor to it, so that's kind of where it, could, it gets its common name as chokeberry. Most people will eat it, but it kind of makes you choke. <laughs> um, it can go all the way to zone 5 around here and go from full sun to part shade. Uh, it has the white flowers and round neck in this area, and then um, red fruit in the fall throughout the spring, and um, then the crimson foliage in the fall, which is a good characteristic. So with this plant, you could eat it. <laughs> um, it has flowers, and it has um, berries, and it has red fall foliage. So good characteristics, and um, it's good for wildlife as well. Maybe not one that you've seen that often, so. Um, hopefully you've all seen this plant. It um, is one of my favorites, the Calicarpa Americana, the Beautyberry. Um, see it often growing in the wild. Um, it can take extreme drought. It is native, and it, I don't ever see it flower very often, but maybe that's because I'm not in the woods when it is flowering. But um, it has these beautiful purple berries that go all the way up the stems and are often used it's um, in arrangements and it uh, is deciduous, it's going to drop all of its leaves in the winter and it's a great bird attractant. So another excellent um, plant selection. Six to eight feet tall though when it gets larger, so it's a large shrub. 
This is um, the latest blooming of our native azaleas. This is the rhododendron cerulata, um, the swamp azalea, and it blooms white, uh, light shade as normal azaleas would. Uh, let's see, it does have a fragrance, kind of a spice clove-like smell to the flowers, and um, it likes more of a swamp type of a setting as its name, the swamp azalea, comes from and it is deciduous, it's going to drop its leaves, not like the normal azalea you go back and plant in your landscape, it's going to drop its leaves. And um, bird and butterfly are trucking, and it has red foliage in the fall before it drops its leaves in the winter time. So that looks more like a honeysuckle. It does, uh -huh. and the native azaleas sometimes do, right now they're real orange and pink, this is a white one, but they drop their leaves the native ones too. So. Much smaller little clusters of plants. Um, this is Agarista popular folia, um, the pipe stem plant or the pipe stem lacopoli is what it's um, called. And it can grow rather large. Um, it has a caning type form to it and really like weepy branches. So it's really pretty along the side of a pond. You would often see it. Um, let's see, it takes full sun to park shade, um, it is native, more of an acid soil, so if you have more of an acid soil, um, maybe pine trees in your area, um, this would be a good choice. It has these bell-shaped light little flowers all up the stem in the spring, and it is evergreen. If you are wondering if this is the plant that maybe you already have, you cut it in half, it has a hollow stem, so that's where the pipe stem plant name comes from. Um, this is Elysium Floridanum Shady Lady and uh, there's many different Elysiums around but this one happens to be a variegated form that has a pinkish purpley bloom that's kind of small and not that um, much of a show but the foliage is a beautiful characteristic of it and it is evergreen um, and with these plants, if you take the leaf and you crush it, it smells like licorice. So um, that's a characteristic. It's not something you'd smell walking by it, but if you took a branch and crushed it, that's what it would smell like, or a leaf. Um, and it is going to get pretty big, seven feet by seven feet on average. A little bit bigger, a little bit smaller um, over time. There are some other anise that do grow 20 feet tall. So. Um, those are more commonly seen in the landscape than I usually see this one, but this is a great choice you may want to look into. Um, so here's just some grasses and perennial type selections for your lower growing plants. Um, this is a grass um, called wild oats or wood oats or some of the common names you'd see it called. Um, it is more of a clump forming grass. Um, and it has wider leaves. Often this is used in arrangements. Um, go out and harvest it and um, it's put in uh, flower arrangements. Um, but it has really pretty seed pods on it um, that turn an autumn reddish color in the fall and then even the plant will dry like it is with those uh, light brown color all throughout the winter and looks really pretty as it blows in the wind. So that's some good characteristics. And it won't really spread too quickly or too in too big of an area. Rhizomes? Yeah. That's underground. It sends out little runners, kind of, is what that means, um, to about three feet wide. It, it's probably going to keep getting bigger over time, but it's not a quick, invasive spreader. Um, let's see. Usually seen growing along streams and rivers. And... Um, Let's see, it gets two to five feet tall. It's a perennial, so it comes back every year. Um, this is an echinacea, um, Adam Saul Crazy Pink. Um, I saw this one in a catalog not too long ago, um, and it's being highlighted because it has more than 100 flowers per plant, making it the most <coughs> floriferous echinacea on the market. So you may find this one more often than you find the others. 
I've heard that the flower head gets so big that you may have to stake them. So, um, but it is a really pretty flower, butterfly, bird attracting. Of course, Echinacea is known for its medicinal um, herbal uh, characteristics. Um, it's drought and heat tolerant. So if you have a place even in your landscape that you're not um, irrigating, this would be a good sort, a good um, plant for that. Um, but I'm going to show you some more pictures of, these are just some more echinaceas that were also on your list as recommended um, well for a rain garden site. And um, as you can see, some of, this doesn't really show the exact size of the heads. I was just trying to give you more of a color range of what the varieties would look like. So, um, but really pretty, um, it would be good to plant maybe a variety of them. And then you could take the cut flowers, it would be really pretty. Um, this is Joe Pye weed. Everyone maybe you've heard of Joe Pye weed, probably if you're from the South. Um, it does grow three to seven feet tall. Um, an excellent bird and butter, well, butterfly attractant plant. And it likes moist sites best rather than a dry site. Um, and then it has these maroonish, purpley type flowers in the late summer as it goes into the winter. Um, this is some hibiscus um, that are recommended for a rain garden site. Um, it has, this is one variety at the top and another variety here. And a cool thing I read about this one, the Papas is um, a master gardener in Baldwin County, received it from their Papa back a few years ago. And then they have since um, bred it and it's available on the market. So it is something from Alabama that is a variety of a hibiscus that grows well here. Um, blames all summer. Bird attractant um, has these beautiful huge fuchsia type pink flowers. Um, but both of these are great. Um, this one at the top is more naturally found in swamps and ditches. So if you see big large flowering um, reddish colored flowers in a ditch somewhere. That's probably what that hibiscus is. So. so these are perennials and not natives? Uh, yes. I don't um, believe that, uh, some of those when you get down into the grasses on the list. Let's see. Um, and like the echinaceas and stuff, they don't really have a native. Uh, some of them don't have native. They are yeah. <laughs> lists of where they're okay. from. So, um, yeah. But great choices with good color and um, about five feet tall. This is an iris alba, so it's white, um, and it's called the Japanese root.